This next section is called Symptoms of Lyme Disease. Next, I'd like to describe the most common symptoms of Lyme disease. Lyme disease is commonly felt to be transmitted by the bite or blood-sucking action of an insect and ticks are commonly mentioned. However, many insects are capable of transmitting the BB spirochete and other important infectious diseases. During acute infection, flu-like symptoms appear. This happens within days or a week of an insect bite. Symptoms may also include fevers, headaches, stiff neck, swollen glands, nausea, vomiting, chills, migrating joint pains, sleep disturbances, and extreme fatigue. About one-third to one-half of patients will experience a hallmark EM bullseye rash. Weeks to months later, additional rashes may appear, although not necessarily resembling a bullseye. These may be disseminated, annular, or oval erythematous or red patches in singular or multiple presentations and may be recurring. Constitutional symptoms may persist throughout this stage. If patients are infected with multiple pathogens at the time of a tick bite, these co-infections will present with a series of symptoms that may parallel those of Lyme. These overlapping presentations serve to confuse doctors and make diagnosis more difficult. As a result, patients are often dismissed, ignored, or told they have some mysterious affliction or that their symptoms are all in their head simply because doctors cannot quantify infections using current laboratory tests. In addition, symptoms may wax and wane sporadically over a period of months or years, further confusing patients and physicians alike. In the second stage of Lyme disease, which can occur weeks, months, or even years later, the organism will migrate from the skin and disseminate into the brain, organs, bones, and central nervous system. Some patients will experience a Bell's palsy, facial paralysis, that is typically unilateral but may be bilateral. Neurologic symptoms may surface and include buzzing or ringing in the ears to deafness, poor balance or coordination, and difficulty walking, eating, talking, swallowing, and or sleeping. The patient may experience meningitis, cranial neuritis, or encephalitis, which can be mild or severe. They may have arthritic and myalgic pains and loss of mobility and other systemic symptoms. These include hair loss, swollen glands, sore throat, chronic dry cough, paralysis, numbness or peripheral neuropathy, gastritis, irritable bladder or bowel, sexual or reproductive dysfunctions, visual and auditory hallucinations, cognitive impairments, memory or word finding difficulties, blindness or other ocular involvement, painful radiculitis, eye pains and other visual disturbances. In addition, patients may experience muscle twitching, including on the face or eyelids, limbs, chest or back, chest pains, vibrations, motion sickness, light sound or odor sensitivities, cardiac arrhythmias or heart block. Additional problems may surface, including incontinence, anxiety, marked irritability, increased frustration intolerance, obsessive compulsive disorders, dark thoughts, and other personality, psychiatric, attention, or mood disorders. Patients with such significant symptoms will be substantially more difficult for physicians to diagnose. In the third or tertiary phase of the illness, patients may have encephalomyelitis, radiculoneuropathies, or encephalopathies. In addition, long-term arthritis and neurologic disorders can and do occur, and depression is commonly found in about two-thirds of patients. Plaques may appear on brain scans. There may be vasculitis with stroke or heart attacks. Eating disorders such as anorexia or overeating and psychiatric presentations such as schizophrenia, dementia, paranoia, and other personality changes may occur. In later stages, autonomic dysfunctions, paralysis, and incapacitation are frequently seen, followed by neurologic syndromes which may include Parkinsonian, multiple sclerosis, or Alzheimer's. In some Lyme patients with select strains of Borrelia, there may appear late cutaneous skin manifestations including Acrodermatitis chronicum atrophicans, or ACA, morphia, or lichen sclerosis A. atrophicus. These symptoms are described in numerous Borrelia-related patents, although they are often refuted by infectious disease doctors in medical texts or in the media. 
One thing to keep in mind is that patent inventions contain sworn testimony and according to a patent for a Lyme disease vaccine, quote, the clinical manifestation of the disease follows a multiphasic time course with different symptoms being demonstrated at each disease stage. Infection is initiated by passage through infected ticks. About 70% of human patients demonstrate a characteristic skin rash termed erythema chronica migrams, or ECM, whose appearance is sometimes accompanied by fever or regional lymphadenopathy. The approximately 30% of infected patients who do not develop ECM proceed to late-stage 1 disease. Spirochetes, monocytes, and neutrophils are present in the ECM lesion. Patient peripheral blood lymphocytes, or PBL, are unresponsive to the organism in vitro and there is no circulating antispirochetal antibodies at this stage. Stage 2 infection is characterized by dissemination of the spirochete to many sites in the body including lymph, heart, neurologic, eyes, liver, respiratory, kidney, and musculoskeletal systems. Headache of excruciating intensity is common although cerebrospinal fluid is normal, end quote. Treatment of Lyme disease consists of antibiotics, although standard treatment recommendations provided by IDSA guidelines have proven ineffective for many patients. Each infection is unique and there are multiple factors involved in treatment which cannot be clearly defined for each patient. Medical guidelines for Lyme disease have been written by members of the Infectious Disease Society of America, or IDSA, and also by the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, or ILADS, to be used as suggestions, but each patient must be treated as an individual because the illness involves many cofactors. Both of these medical organizations have esteemed and qualified physicians and scientific members. However, the two camps with respect to Lyme disease are divided in viewpoints on disease pathology and treatment protocols. This division leaves patients struggling to receive both accurate diagnoses and effective treatments and has helped to create an air of political tension unrivaled in any other area of medicine. As I write this book, both sets of medical recommendations have recently expired, leaving political camps wide open for speculation and no clear directives for the clinical practitioner.